5. Try to solve your problem with single-minded concentration, and if that doesn't work, get your mind busy elsewhere. At exactly the right time, the ideal solution will emerge from your intuition or appear in your life. Your superconscious mind works for you in direct proportion to your complete trust and confidence in it. Practice letting go on a regular basis and wait patiently until exactly the right answer comes to you, at exactly the right time. Chapter 18 Remain flexible at all times. When I have finally decided that a result is worth getting, I go ahead on it and make trial after trial until it comes. Thomas Edison. It is in the nature of things that some people will be more successful and happier than others. Some people will make more money, have better lives, enjoy greater fulfillment and satisfaction, have happier relationships and contribute more to their communities. Others will not. The Menninger Institute of Kansas City conducted a study not long ago to determine what qualities would be most important for success and happiness in the 21. Street. Century. They concluded, after extensive. Research, that the most important single quality that you can develop, in a time of rapid change, is the quality of, flexibility. The opposite of flexibility is, rigidity. The opposite of flexible thinking is fixed or mechanical thinking. The opposite of approaching life with an open mind is to react automatically and predictably in every situation. The opposite of flexibility is an unwillingness to change in the face of new information or circumstances. The quality of flexibility is therefore essential if you want to be, do and have more than the average person. The speed of change. Today, perhaps the most important factor affecting your life is the speed of change. We are living in an age where change is taking place at a faster rate than ever before in human history. And if anything, the rate of change is increasing, year by year. Change today is not only faster, but it is also discontinuous, not following a straight line but starting, stopping and going off in unpredictable directions. Change is coming at us from all sides and in so many different ways that it is often impossible to anticipate what might happen next. By its very nature, change is unpredictable, often forcing us to scrap our very best plans and ideas overnight is the result of a completely new and unexpected development coming from a new and unexpected direction. As a result, we have to remain flexible in our thinking and in our possible courses of action. A major cause of stress. Change causes enormous stress for people who are fixed or rigid in their beliefs about how things should be. They fall in love with what they are doing, with their current methods and processes, and are unwilling to change, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. Don't let this happen to you. The only real question you should be asking about what you are doing is, does it work? Is it achieving the end results desired? Based on the current situation, is this the best course of action? The only measure of the rightness or wrongness of a particular decision or course of action is its effectiveness in accomplishing the result desired, or achieving the goal you have set. Keep asking, does it work? Three factors driving change. There are three factors driving change today, each of them multiplying times each other to increase the speed of change. The first change factor is the explosion of information and knowledge, in every area of our lives. One new discovery or piece of information in a competitive marketplace can change the dynamics of your business overnight. A popular product or service, or major industry, can be rendered obsolete by a new product or service that achieves the same result faster, better, cheaper or easier than something else. A critical news event, such as 9-11, a market shock, such as that caused by Wall Street revelations, a scandal in a political party or industry, can transform the thinking, actions, sales, and situation of an entire business or industry overnight. For example, in 1989, when the Soviet Union dissolved, the Iron Curtain came down and the Cold War ended. The defense industry across America was severely shaken. Hundreds of thousands of highly trained and skilled men and women were laid off permanently. Entire industries were shut down and certain parts of the country were thrown into recession. The effects of change were overwhelming and unavoidable. Only the flexible were able to react and respond effectively. Be open to new information. To remain flexible, you must be constantly open, alert to new ideas, information and knowledge that can help you or hurt you in your business, or in the achievement of your goals. One new idea can be enough to make or lose you a fortune. One idea can start you on the road to riches, or knock you off it. 
One piece of information, at the right time, can save you enormous amounts of time, trouble and money. Lack of that information can cost you a fortune. All leaders are readers. It is absolutely essential that you keep current in your field. Read the magazines and publications put out by your industry. Read the best-selling books in your field. Attend seminars and conferences. Join your industry associations and network with other people in your business. The power is always on the side of the person with the best and most current information. The tide of new technology. The second factor driving change is the rapid growth and development of new technology. Every new piece of scientific or technical knowledge leads to an advance in technology aimed at helping people and companies get things done faster, better, cheaper or easier. And the speed of technological change is increasing every day. The rule is that, whatever works is already obsolete. A new piece of high-tech equipment put on the shelf is obsolete before it is unpacked. New technology today has a shelf life of six months before it is replaced by something that will do the job faster and cheaper. If you are not looking for ways to replace your product or service with something better, you can be assured that your competitors are staying up late at night looking for ways to do you one better and put you out of business. Playing Leapfrog Being in business today is like playing an endless game of leapfrog. You look for a way to leapfrog your competitor and serve your customers better, faster and cheaper. Your competitor then leapfrogs over you with a newer or better product or service. You quickly regroup and leap over your competitor with a new innovation or improvement. Your competitor then leaps over you, and the game goes on without end. The same principle of accelerating obsolescence applies to your products, your services, your processes and especially to your sales and marketing strategies. It applies to your current advertising and methods of promotion. Whatever works, will soon stop working. Either customers will become bored with it, your competitors will copy it, or it will no longer attract customers in the current marketplace. Expect to be imitated. Not long ago, I hired an advertising agency and paid them $10,000 to develop an ad for me, which I then ran in a national newspaper. It was a powerful ad and drew a lot of good responses. We were walking around the office patting each other on the back until the following week. When a competitor came out with the identical ad that we had paid to have created, but aimed at selling his product rather than ours. Our response rate dropped by 50% and continued to fall. And there was very little that we could do. You must be continually developing backup plans for every aspect of your business, knowing without doubt that, whatever you are doing, it will soon stop working and will have to be replaced by something else that does. Watch out for the comfort zone. We spoke earlier about the comfort zone and how both individuals and organizations often fall into it and keep on doing the same things, over and over, whether they are working or not. Sometimes the greatest danger to your long-term success can be short-term success. Success in any area can quickly breed complacency and a reluctance to change in response to the new realities of the marketplace. Don't let this happen to you. Competitive pressures are unending. The third element driving change and requiring greater flexibility is competition. Your competitors, local, national and international, are more determined and creative today than they have ever been before. They are constantly looking for ways to take your customers away, steal your sales, reduce your cash flow and, if possible, put you out of business. They are aggressively selling their products or services using every argument and advantage they can possibly develop to undermine your position in the marketplace. Your competitors are aggressively using new information and technology to render you obsolete and to gain a competitive advantage. Today, there are more companies, products, services and salespeople than there are customers or buyers for them. The competition is becoming tougher and more intense. If you want to survive and thrive in this market, you must become even more focused and determined yourself. Above all, you must be flexible. Zero base everything regularly. Earlier, I talked about the importance of zero-based thinking in examining every part of your life and activities today. Zero-based thinking is a vital tool in remaining flexible as well. Continually ask, is there anything that I am doing today that knowing what I now know, I wouldn't get into again today if I had to do it over? Look at every part of your life and business. Wherever you experience stress, resistance, or lack of success, ask the zero-based thinking question. And if there is something that you would not start up again today, 
make plans immediately to get out of it and to channel your resources and energies where you can get better results. Don't let your ego cloud your judgment or your common sense. Be more concerned with what's right rather than who's right. You must be open to the fact that most of your decisions will turn out to be wrong in the fullness of time. Be prepared to be flexible, especially in the face of new information, technology or competition. Three magic statements. There are three statements that you can learn to say, over and over, to remain flexible in turbulent times. Here they are. The first is, I was wrong. Most people would rather bluff, bluster and deny rather than to admit that they were wrong. What makes the refusal to admit you are wrong even worse is when everyone around you already knows that you are wrong. You are the only one who is fooling anyone, and that one person you are attempting to fool is yourself. When you realize that you are wrong, the smartest thing you can do is to admit it quickly, solve the problem and get on with achieving the goal or result. It has been estimated that as much as 80% of the time and energy of the key people in large companies and organizations is devoted to covering up the fact that they are wrong, and they don't want to admit it. Many companies, small and large, have gone bankrupt because of a refusal or failure to admit an obvious mistake. Admit that you are not perfect. The second statement that you must learn to say to remain flexible is, I made a mistake. It is amazing how much time, energy and money is wasted because someone's ego is so large that they will not admit they have made a mistake, even one that is obvious to everyone around them. Once you say, I was wrong, or, I made a mistake, the issue is largely over. From then on, everybody can get on with resolving the problem or achieving the goal. But as long as a key person is unwilling to admit that he or she has taken the wrong course, everything comes to a stop. We have seen this repeatedly in national politics where the failure of a single person to admit a mistake or blunder has led to tremendous waste of time and energy for everyone involved, and often, for the entire nation. Adapt to new information quickly. The third statement you should learn to say quickly and easily is, I changed my mind. If you get new information that contradicts the information upon which you made a previous decision, be prepared to admit candidly that, I changed my mind. It is not a weakness or a character flaw to be wrong, to make a mistake or to change your mind. In fact, in a time of rapid change in the areas of knowledge, technology and competition, it is a mark of courage, character and flexibility to be willing to, cut your losses, quickly and practice the, reality principle, in everything you do. Be willing to deal with the world as it is, rather than the way you wish it were, or the way that it might have been in the past. Face the truth, whatever it is. Be honest with yourself and everyone around you. Remain open to new realities. Always be open to reevaluating your goals and objectives in the light of new information, technology or competition. Based on what you now know, is this the best course of action? If it is not, what else should you do? What else could you do? If it is a goal, and the circumstances under which you made the goal have changed dramatically, be sure that you still want it badly enough to struggle and sacrifice for it. Be willing to drop it and set a new goal if you have changed your mind, or if the goal is no longer as important to you today as it once was. In a time of rapid change, resolve to be the first to recognize and embrace change when it occurs. Expect it as part of the normal and natural course of events. Refuse to be surprised or upset when things do not work out the way you thought they would, or should. Be flexible in your relationships. Especially, be flexible with the important people in your life, your family, your friends, your co-workers and your customers. Be open to differing points of view and different ideas. Be continually willing to admit that you could be wrong, because you often are. One of the characteristics of the best leaders is that they are good listeners. They ask a lot of questions and take in all the information possible before making up their minds or coming to a final conclusion. They also admit failure and cut their losses quickly when they make a mistake so they can move on to bigger and better things. The theory of procession. There is another aspect of flexibility that you should bear in mind for the rest of your life and career. Buckminster Fuller, the scientist and philosopher, called it the theory of procession, which does not appear in any dictionary or encyclopedia. Dr. Robert Ronstadt of Babson College called it the corridor principle. Napoleon Hill referred to this finding by the most successful people in America by saying that, within every setback or obstacle there lies the seed of an equal or greater opportunity or benefit. 
What this means is that, when you set a new goal for yourself, you will have a general idea of the steps you should take and the direction you should pursue. But almost inevitably, as you start off, you will run into unexpected roadblocks that make it impossible to continue in that direction. However, by some miracle, just as you reach a wall, another door of opportunity will open along the corridor to success. Because you are flexible, you will quickly take advantage of the new opportunity and begin moving in that direction, developing that new product or service, selling into that new market or customer base. But as you move down this new corridor, you will run into another obstacle or roadblock that might again block your progress. Just as you hit this new wall or obstruction however, another opportunity will open up for you and take you down a different corridor toward your goal. This may happen several times, with several false starts. In almost every case, you will achieve your greatest success in an area very different from what you initially thought when you started out. You will achieve your greatest business and personal successes doing things that are very different from what you had initially planned. The key is to remain flexible. Be both clear and flexible. Here is the most important rule of flexibility. Be clear about your goal but be flexible about the process of achieving it. Always be open to the influence of your superconscious mind. Remain sensitive to the possibility of serendipitous and synchronous events. Be open to ideas, inspirations and inputs from other people. In the New Testament, Jesus said, you must become like a little child if you would enter into the kingdom of heaven. One interpretation of these words is that you must remain open-minded, flexible, calm, confident and curious if you want to be able to recognize new opportunities and possibilities as they open up around you on your journey toward your goal. Resolve to remain flexible and open, no matter what happens. Remember, there is almost always a better way to accomplish any task, or to achieve any goal. Your aim should be to be alert and aware to what it might be, to find it and then to take action in that new direction as quickly as possible. This will ensure that you inevitably reach your goal, sometimes in the most unexpected and surprising ways. Remain flexible at all times. 1. Regularly ask yourself the question, what do I really, really want to do with my life? And then make sure that your current goals and activities are in harmony with your answer. 2. Be completely honest and realistic with your life and goals. Resolve to see the world as it is, not as you wish it were, or could be. What changes does this practice suggest? 3. Be willing to admit, in each area of your life where you experience stress or resistance, that you could be wrong, or that you have made a mistake. Resolve today to cut your losses wherever possible. 4. If the situation has changed, or you have new information, be willing to change your mind and make a new decision based on the facts as they exist today. Refuse to persist in a course of action that does not make good sense. Look into each problem or obstacle you face and seek the valuable lesson or benefit it contains. Should you change your direction or course of action based on new information or experience? If so, do it now. Chapter 19 Unlock Your Inborn Creativity Make every thought, every fact, that comes into your mind pay you a profit. Make it work and produce for you. Think of things not as they are but as they may be. Don't merely dream but create. Robert Collier. Tony Buzan is a brain expert. He is the past president of the Mensa Society, an organization only open to people who score in the top 2% on standardized IQ tests, and an author of several books on creativity, learning and intelligence. According to him, and to many other authorities in the field, the mental potential of the average person is largely untapped and virtually unlimited. Your neocortex, your thinking brain, has approximately 100 billion cells or neurons. Each of these cells bristles, like a porcupine, with as many as 20,000 ganglia or fibers that connect it to other brain cells. Each of these cells is, in turn, connected and interconnected to thousands and millions of other cells, like an electric grid that lights up and powers a large city. Each of these cells, and each connection between these cells, contains an element of mental energy or information that is available to every other cell. This means that the complexity of your brain is therefore beyond belief or imagination. According to Tony Buzan, and other brain experts, the number of combinations and permutations of brain connections you have is greater than the number of molecules in the known universe. It would be the equivalent of the number one followed by eight pages of zeros, row after row and page after page. Enormous reserve capacity. 
As mentioned earlier, the average person uses about 1% or 2% of their brain capacity for 100% of their functioning in life and work. The rest is reserve capacity that is seldom tapped into or used for any reason. Most people go to their graves with their music still in them. You do not need to achieve a miracle to bring about spectacular results in your life. You only need to use a little bit more of your existing brain power than you are using today. This small improvement in your thinking ability can change your life so profoundly that both you and others will be astonished by what you accomplish in the months and years ahead. According to research conducted by Professor Sergei Yefremov in Russia some years ago, he concluded that if you could use just 50% of your existing mental capacity, you could complete the Ph. D. requirements of a dozen universities, learn a dozen languages with ease and memorize the entire 22 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Double your income. If you are currently using only 2% of your mental potential, and you could increase that to 4%, you could double your income, shoot ahead in your profession, rise to the top of your field and transform your life. If you could use 5% or 6% or 7% of your potential, you would begin performing at a level that would amaze yourself and everyone around you. It was estimated that even Albert Einstein never used more than 10% to 15% of his mental potential at the height of his powers, and he was considered to one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived. Creativity is a natural ability. Fully 95% of children tested between the ages of 3 and 5 test out as highly creative. The same children, tested again as teenagers, test out at about 5% highly creative. What happened to them in the interim? As they went through school, they were taught that, if you want to get along, you go along. They learned not to challenge the teacher or to suggest unusual ideas. In their attempts to be liked and accepted by their peers, they allowed their creativity to die down, like a fire without fuel. The good news is that creativity is a natural and normal ability, possessed in quantity by virtually everyone. It is inborn, a part of your genetic structure, a faculty that is uniquely human. Everyone is creative. Fully 95% of the population has the ability to function at exceptional, if not genius levels, given the right situation and circumstances. Use it or lose it. But your creativity is like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. Just like a muscle, if you do not exercise your creativity and stretch it regularly, it becomes weak and ineffective. Your ability to generate ideas must be constantly utilized to be kept in top condition. Fortunately, at any time, you can begin tapping into your creativity and using it at a higher level. You can actually begin activating more neurons and dendrites in your brain, creating more and more connections and interconnections. Each time you use more of your existing brain power, you become even more capable of thinking better and with greater clarity. Ideas are the new source of wealth. Today, we are in the information age. For the rest of your life, ideas will be the major source of new wealth. Ideas contain the keys to solving every problem. They are the most important tools for achieving any goals. And since your ability to generate new ideas is largely unlimited, your ability to achieve any goal you set for yourself is unlimited as well. All wealth comes from adding value, from producing more, better, cheaper, faster and easier than someone else. One good idea for adding value for others is all you need to start a fortune. When you have clear goals, written and rewritten, visualized and emotionalized, you trigger your conscious, subconscious and superconscious minds into generating a continuous flow of ideas for goal attainment. Solve any problem. There is no problem you cannot solve, no obstacle you cannot overcome and no goal that you cannot achieve by tapping into your creative mind, exactly as it is today. You have far more intelligence and mental potential right now than you could ever use, even if you lived 100 years. Just because you have not accessed all of your mental powers up until now does not mean that you cannot begin using them from this day forward. Physical fitness and mental fitness are very similar, in some respects. If you want to become physically fit, you have to work out and engage in physical exercise. If you want to build physical muscles, you must pump iron and drive new blood into your muscles by straining them with dumbbells or barbells. The more stress you put on your muscles, the stronger they become over time. Your mind is very similar. In order to build your mental muscles, you have to pump mental iron. You have to put stress and strain on your brain, 
concentrating all of your mental energies to generate ideas and solutions, and to solve problems on the way to your goals. Practice mint storming regularly. The most powerful technique for improving your intelligence and increasing your creativity is what I call mint storming. The way it works is simple. The results that you get will be so amazing as to be life changing. You begin the mint storming process by first getting a clean sheet of paper. At the top of this page, you write your goal or problem in the form of a question. The simpler and more specific the question, the better will be the quality of the answers that you generate in response to it. For example, instead of writing a question like, How can I make more money? you would write, How can I double my income in the next 24 months? Even better, if you are earning $50,000 per year today, your question should be, How can I earn $100,000 per year by December 31st of a specific year? Each of your answers should be written using the 3 P formula. It should be personal, positive, and in the present tense. In other words, your answers should be written as affirmations or instructions from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind. Often, you will write down answers on this sheet and promptly forget them. Then, sometime later, as a result of superconscious functioning, you will attract into your life an opportunity to put one of your answers into action. Mastering the method. Once you have written your question at the top of the page, you then discipline yourself to generate at least 20 answers to that question. You can write down more than 20 answers to the question, but it is essential in this exercise that you set a goal for a minimum of 20. Your first 3 to 5 answers will be easy. You will quickly come up with answers like, work harder, start earlier and stay later, work on higher value tasks. Your next 5 answers will be more difficult. You will have to drill down and dig deeper to come up with less obvious ways but more creative ways to answer your question. Your last 10 answers will be the most difficult of all. Many people find this part of the exercise so difficult that their minds go blank. Their eyes glaze over. They become lightheaded with the rush of blood to their brains that takes place when you begin this process of pumping mental iron. However, no matter how long it takes, especially the first few times you practice this exercise, you must discipline yourself to keep writing until you have at least 20 answers. Sometimes the 20 th answer that you generate will be the breakthrough answer that enables you to save yourself thousands of dollars and many hours of hard work. Often, your last answer is the inspired idea that changes your life and career. Select one action. Once you have at least 20 answers, go back over your list and review your answers. Then, select at least one action that you can take immediately to begin moving yourself more rapidly toward your goal, or toward solving the problem. You can multiple the effectiveness of this process by taking the very best answer that you identified in the first list of 20 and writing it at the top of a fresh sheet of paper in the form of a question. Then, see if you cannot generate 20 answers to that question as well. This combination exercise will rev you up mentally like stepping on the accelerator of a car while the transmission is in neutral. Your mind will sparkle and dance with mental energy, and bristle with ideas, like the bright lights of a Christmas tree. For example, your first question could be, how can I double my income to $100,000 over the next 24 months? One of your answers could be, I work two extra hours each day. You could transfer this answer to a new sheet of paper and phrase it as a question, what can I do to get two extra hours of productive time each day? You can then begin writing 20 different things that you can do to save time, gain time and spend two additional hours on productive work each day. Whatever answer you choose, put it into action immediately. Do something. Do anything. The faster you take action on this exercise, the greater and more continuous will be the flow of ideas as you go throughout the day. If you generate these ideas and then do nothing with them, the creative flow will slow down and stop. Use mint storming on every goal. The very best time to do this exercise is first thing in the morning, right after you have rewritten your goals in your spiral notebook. Each morning, you can take one goal, rewrite it as a question and then generate 20 answers to that question. You can then immediately get busy and implement one of your answers. You can perform this exercise repeatedly on the same goal, if the goal is big enough and important enough to you. Don't worry about writing down the same answers, over and over again. The more you practice this exercise, the more likely it is that you will trigger completely unexpected breakthrough ideas. 
This may require several days or even weeks of work before the flash of inspiration takes place. You must be patient and determined. It will come. The cumulative power of idea generation. Imagine that you were to perform this exercise every morning before you started out, five days per week. You can take the weekends off to relax your brain. If you did this exercise five days per week, you would generate 100 ideas per week. If you practiced this exercise 50 weeks per year, you would generate 5,000 ideas over the course of the next 12 months. And you don't even have to think on your vacation. If you were then to implement one new idea each day to help you to move faster toward your goals, that would work out to one idea per day, multiplied times 5 days per week, multiplied times 50 weeks per year. This would amount to 250 new ideas per year that you would implement in your life. Now, here is a question, do you think that this exercise, conducted regularly, would have an impact on your life and future? In a world where the average person has very few ideas at all during the year, do you think that this exercise would give you an edge in your field? Do you think that, if you did this every day, you would soon become wealthy and successful in anything to which you applied yourself? I think the answer is clear. One good idea can save you years of hard work, or thousands of dollars. A multiple of good ideas, one after the other, building on each other, will make you rich, happy and successful, virtually without fail. Focus on the solution. As mentioned earlier, successful people are intensely solution-oriented. The fact is that life is a continuous succession of problems and difficulties, without end. This river of problems is only interrupted by the occasional crisis, which makes the problems seem small in comparison. In fact, if you are living a busy life, you will probably experience a crisis of some kind every two to three months throughout your life. You will have business crises, family crises, financial crises, health crises and other crises. The problems and crises never stop. They keep coming, like the waves of the ocean. The only thing you can control is your responses to these problems and crises. And therein lies the key to your success. Successful people respond effectively to problems. Ineffective people do not. Successful people take a deep breath, relax and think clearly. They look for the good in every situation. They seek the valuable lesson. Above all, they focus on the solution, on what can be done, rather than what has happened and who is to blame. Deal with each problem effectively. There is a methodology that you can use to solve any problem. It requires that you approach the business of problem solving systematically and in an organized fashion. Just like there is a process for solving mathematical problems, there is a process for solving business and life problems, and you can learn it use it for the rest of your career. Step 1. Define the problem clearly. A problem properly defined is half solved. It is absolutely amazing how much time is wasted floundering around looking for a solution when no one is quite clear about the problem. Step 2. Ask, what are all the possible causes of this problem? Look for both the obvious and the not-so-obvious causes of the problem. How did it begin? What are its origins? What triggered it in the first place? What is the critical variable that changed to cause the problem in the first place? What assumptions were made that led to the problem? Just like a doctor conducting an intensive examination on a sick patient, you should thoroughly dissect the problem before you attempt to solve it. Step 3. Ask, what are all the possible solutions? Avoid the natural tendency of most human beings to leap from a problem definition to a conclusion regarding a solution of some kind. Always ask, what else is the solution? Sometimes the best solution is to nothing at all. Sometimes the best solution is to gather more information. Sometimes, the best solution is to realize that this is not your problem and pass it on to someone else whose responsibility it is. Step 4. Once you have identified several possible solutions, ask, what must this solution accomplish? The only way you can judge the attractiveness of a solution is to determine, in advance, what you want the solution to accomplish. You've heard it said that, the operation was a success, but the patient died. It is very common for us to initiate a solution, and implement it, but the problem is not only not solved, but it is worse than it was before we took action in the first place. Be sure that the solution you select will accomplish the purpose you had in mind when you started on the problem-solving exercise in the first place. Step 5. Once you have decided on the ideal solution, assign specific responsibility, or take responsibility yourself for implementing the solution. 
Set a deadline for implementation. Set a measure by which you can determine if the solution has been effective. A problem-solving discussion that does not lead to agreement on a specific solution, accompanied by the assignment of personal responsibility and a deadline, is a problem that will come back over and over again, without resolution. Practice this systematic method of dealing with a problem over and over until it becomes a habit of thinking. You will be amazed at how much more effective you become, and how much better your results will be using this method. The key to victory and success. In studying warfare and battles over the centuries, I have always been fascinated by the situations where a smaller force defeated a numerically superior force. In every case, what I discovered was that the numerically smaller force was far better organized, more methodical and more orderly in its plan of attack and execution than was the larger, more disorganized force. By the same token, an ordinary person, with a system or recipe for problem solving, can run circles around highly intelligent or well-educated people who throw themselves at their problems without a method or process for solving them. These two methodologies, mint-storming and the systematic approach, give you a tremendous advantage in mastering the inevitable problems and difficulties of life. Write it down. Always be sure to think on paper. Write things down. There is something that happens between the brain and the hand when you write. You get a greater sense of clarity and understanding with regard to the issues involved. You think better. Your perception is sharper. You actually become smarter and more creative by the very act of writing everything down as you go along and before you make a decision. Play down the chessboard. One of the most powerful creative thinking exercises you can practice is called scenario planning. In scenario planning, you play down the chessboard of life and imagine what might happen sometime in the future. Even though the future is largely unknowable, certain trends taking place today will continue into the future. Certain events taking place around you will affect these trends, if not interrupt them in different ways. Completely unexpected events will arise that will require that you change your plans completely. Answer two questions. In scenario planning, you ask yourself two questions. First, what are the three worst things that could possibly happen in the months or years ahead that would negatively affect my business or my personal life? Write them down. Be brutally honest with yourself. Refuse to wish or hope for the best. For example, imagine that your best customer went out of business or was unable to pay you for the products or services that you had sold to him. What would you do? How would you react? What steps could you take to guard against this eventuality? Next, ask yourself, what are the three best things that could possibly happen to me in the months and years ahead? With your answers to either of these questions, you can use mintstorming to prepare yourself for any eventuality. If it is a potential setback, ask yourself, how could we guard against this setback? Then generate 20 answers to this question. If it is a possible opportunity, ask yourself, how could we increase the likelihood of this opportunity taking place, or take advantage of this opportunity as it is today? Write out 20 answers to this question, as well. Each time you ask yourself one of these questions, like an electric spark, you will trigger ideas and insights. The more you think about these key questions, the more you will activate your superconscious mind to give you insights and flashes of inspiration that will enable you to seize opportunities or avoid dangers. Develop your options. One of the most important parts of your personal philosophy should revolve around the development of options. The rule is, you are only as free as your well-developed alternatives. If your goal is to be happy, successful and free, you must have choices. There must be more than one thing that you can do, in every situation. You can never allow yourself to be trapped with only one course of action open to you. From the time you take your first job, make your first investment or embark on any part of life, you should immediately begin to develop an alternative to that, if something should go wrong. Develop your plan B. Frederick von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor of 19. Th. Century. Germany was considered to be the finest statesman of his age. He was able to juggle competing nations, principalities and powers against each other in the process of forming Germany into a unified national state. His political life was an endless process of negotiating, back and forth, winning and losing, time after time. Bismarck was famous for always having a backup plan completely developed before he began negotiations on his main plan. 
This became known as a Bismarck plan, a plan B. You should always have a plan B for the important parts of your business and personal life as well. What is your plan B? What is your backup plan if your current job, career, industry or course of action does not work out successfully? What is your backup plan if your current investments do not work out, or if your best laid plans fail? What are your alternatives? What would you do if you found yourself out on the street tomorrow, or in the position of having to start over? The more options you have, the greater mental freedom you have, as well. The more alternatives you have thought through and developed, the greater power you will have in any situation. The more that you have developed different courses of action, in case the one you are following does not work out, the greater confidence in you will have. This is why one of the most important things you do throughout life is to increase the range of your freedom of action. Use your creativity to develop options and alternatives continually, no matter how well things are going at the moment. Long term thinking. Your ultimate goal in your business and your career is to earn as much money as possible and to achieve financial independence. All profit, all financial success in our society comes from adding value of some kind. When you add value, you put yourself into a position to capture some of that value in the form of increased income, profit, or dividends. This is the basic law of all market economics, and like most basic laws, it is unknown or misunderstood by most people working in our society today. One of the questions you can ask in your mint storming exercise is, what can I do to increase my value to my customers today? You might ask, who are my ideal customers? What can I do to attract more of my ideal customers into buying from me? Best of all, you should ask, what would I have to do to deserve more of exactly the kind of customers that I want to have? What could you do more of, or start doing, to be more deserving of having more of the customers you really want? Add value continually. Always be looking for ways to use your creativity to add value by doing things faster, better, cheaper, or easier in some way. Just as the word deserve comes from the Latin roots de and service, which mean from service, you should always be looking for ways to deserve greater rewards from serving your customers better in some way. In the final analysis, as a member of society, as a player, in our economic system, your riches and rewards will come from your ability to serve other people better than your competitors. Use your intelligence and your creativity every single day to find ways to make yourself more valuable to your company, your industry, and your world. This is the true hallmark of personal genius. Unlock your inborn creativity. 1. Select your most important goal, or biggest problem, and write it at the top of a sheet of paper as question. Then discipline yourself to generate 20 answers to that question, and implement one of those answers immediately. 2. Approach every problem systematically by defining it clearly, developing possible solutions, making a decision and then implementing the solution as soon as possible. 3. Think on paper. Write down every detail of a problem or goal and look for simple, practical ways to solve the problem or achieve the goal. 4. Identify the best and worst things that could happen to you in the months ahead. Determine what you could do to reduce the effects of the worst outcomes and maximize the benefits or likelihood of the best possible outcomes. You are only as free as your options. Develop a plan B for every important area of your business and personal life. Chapter 20 Do something every day. My success evolved from working hard at the business at hand every day. Johnny Carson Many studies have been conducted over the years to try to determine why it is that some people are more successful than others. Hundreds, and even thousands of salespeople, staff and managers have been interviewed, tested and studied in an attempt to identify the common denominators of success. One of the most important success factors discovered, over and over again, is the quality of action orientation. Successful people are intensely action-oriented. They seem to move faster than unsuccessful people. They are busier. They try more things, and they try harder. They start a little earlier and they stay a little later. They are in constant motion. Unsuccessful people, on the other hand, start at the last moment necessary and quit at the first moment possible. They are fastidious about taking every minute of coffee breaks, lunch hours, sick leave and vacations. They sometimes brag, when I am not at work, I never even think about it. A story of failure. We used to have an employee who was always late. 
When we spoke to him about this, he explained that his reason for being late was the traffic. We suggested to him that he leave earlier so that the traffic would not be a problem. He was shocked. He said, but if I left earlier, and there was no traffic, I might arrive at work earlier than my starting time. I couldn't possibly do that. Needless to say, we soon let him go and hired someone else with a greater sense of responsibility and commitment. We heard later that he has continued on with the endless round of part-time jobs and unemployment that has marked his career throughout his life. His attitude has set him up for failure time and time again. The Law of Compensation In his famous essay Compensation, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that you will always be compensated in life in direct proportion to the value of your contribution. If you want to increase the size of your rewards, you must increase the quality and quantity of your results. If you want to get more out, you have to put more in. And there is no other way. Napoleon Hill found that the key quality of successful men and women, most of whom started at the bottom, many of them penniless, was that early in life, they developed the habit of going the extra mile. They discovered, as the old saying goes, that there are never any traffic jams on the extra mile. The quality of self-made millionaires. In one study of self-made millionaires, researchers interviewed thousands of men and women who had started with nothing and who had accumulated more than a million dollars in the course of their careers. These self-made millionaires almost unanimously agreed that their success was the result of always doing more than they were paid for. They had made it a habit from their first jobs to always put in more than they took out. They were always looking for ways to contribute beyond what was expected of them. Lifelong career success. When I speak to a graduating class of business students, they often ask me, usually with some concern, if I can give them some suggestions or ideas on what they can do to be successful in the world of work. I always give them the same advice. It worked for me when I was a young man and it works for everybody, at every stage of his or her career. My advice consists of two parts. First, as soon as you get settled in at your new job, and you are on top of your work, Go to your boss and tell him or her that you want more responsibility. Tell him or her that you are determined to make the maximum contribution possible in this organization and that you would very much like more responsibility whenever it becomes available. When I first started doing this as a young executive with a large corporation, my boss nodded and smiled and thanked me for my interest. But nothing happened, at least for a while. Every few days, I would report to my boss and mention, in parting, that I wanted more responsibility. Your chance will come. After a few weeks of this, my boss gave me a project to study and evaluate. I jumped on it like a dog jumping on a bone and ran off. I worked day and night, and throughout the weekend, tearing that project apart, gathering research, reassembling the details and putting together a report and a proposal. On Monday morning, I was back to my boss with a complete proposal on the project. He was obviously surprised. He said, there was no rush. I didn't expect anything back from you for a week or two. I thanked him for his concern and told him that, this project evaluation is complete, as you requested. And by the way, I would really like more responsibility. Things began to change for me very soon after that project evaluation. A week later, I was given another small task, completely outside my range of duties. Again, I grabbed the task and completed it to the best of my ability. A week or two later, my boss gave me another task, and then a week later, still another task. In every case, whatever it was, whether I knew anything about it or not, I immediately went to work on it, often on my own time, and on the weekends. I would get it done and back to my boss as fast as I could. Move fast on opportunities. This brings me to my second piece of advice for anyone who wants to be successful in his or her career. Once you get the responsibility that you have asked for, complete it quickly and well, and get it back to your boss as fast as you can, as though it was a grenade with the pin pulled out. Move quickly. Don't delay. It is absolutely amazing the positive impression you will make on other people when you keep asking for more responsibility. And when you get the responsibility, you complete the task quickly. Very soon, my boss had marked me down as the go-to guy. Whenever something came up that he needed handling immediately, he called me rather than any of the other executives, some of whom had been working there for several years. In no time, I began to move up in the organization. Be prepared for your opportunity. One day, 
He threw me a task, like a football to a tight end in a close game, which I caught and ran with for a touchdown. By acting quickly, flying a thousand miles and working day and night, I discovered a fraud and saved the company $2 million. If I had delayed even a couple of days, the money would have been lost forever. After that success, the dam broke. First I was given a large assignment, and then responsibility for an entire new division, and then another new division, and then a third. By the time I had been working for that company for two years, I was running three divisions involving almost $50 million dollars worth of business activities and managing a staff of more than 50 people in three offices. Meanwhile, my co-workers were still coming in at 9 o'clock sharp, going for lunch with each other and quitting at 5 o'clock to go for drinks at the bar. They muttered and told each other that the reason I was moving up was because I was lucky or the boss was playing favorites. They never learned the importance of asking for more responsibility and moving fast. A secret of success. The retiring president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, many years ago, told a story at his going away dinner. He had become one of the most respected businesspeople in America and overseas. He had developed the kind of reputation for high quality work that every person in business dreams of having. He said that when he was a young man, unsuccessful and frustrated, he came across a saying written on a brown lunch bag and posted on a high school bulletin board. As he passed the bulletin board, something caused him to stop and he read the words on the lunch bag. They said, your success in life will be in direct proportion to what you do after you do what you are expected to do. He told the audience that these words changed his life. Up to that time in his career, he felt that he was doing a good job because he was doing what he had been told to do, what he was expected to do. But from that point onward, he resolved that he would do far more than what was expected of him. He resolved that he would always go the extra mile and to do more than he was paid for. From that day onward, for the rest of his career, he got up a little earlier, worked a little harder and stayed a little later. He moved faster from task to task and from customer to customer. And here is what always happens. The faster he moved, the more experience he got. The more experience he got, the better he got at his job. The better he got, the better results he got in the same period of time. In no time at all, he was being paid more and promoted faster. By moving faster and always doing more than expected, he had shifted onto the fast track in his career and began moving ahead rapidly. He was soon promoted into a new department, then hired into a new industry, and given a new area of responsibility. In each case, he had one strategy. Do more than you are paid for. Do more than others expect. Go the extra mile. Get busy. Get going. Take action. Don't waste time. And he never looked back. Wisdom of a founding father. Thomas Jefferson wrote, Determine never to be idle. No person will have occasion to complain of the want of time, who never loses any. It is wonderful how much may be done, if we are always doing. Later, he wrote, The rising sun has never caught me in bed in my entire life. The time will pass anyway. Here's an important point. The time is going to pass anyway. The weeks, months and years of your life are going to go by, in any case. The only question is, what are you going to do with this time? Since the day is going to go past in any case, why not start a little earlier, work a little harder and stay a little later? Why not put yourself on the side of the angels? Why not develop a reputation as the go-to guy or gal who everyone looks to when they need to get something done quickly and well? This will do more to put your foot on the accelerator of your career than anything else you can imagine. Get going and keep going. There is a key to high income called the momentum principle of success. This principle says that it takes considerable energy to get yourself into motion and moving. But it takes much less energy to keep yourself moving, once you get going. This momentum principle explains success as much as any other factor. Successful people are busy people. They get up and they get going, and they keep going all day long. They work all the time they work. They are constantly in motion, like moving targets. Plan your time carefully. Successful people plan their days and hours, and even their quarter hours very carefully. In every study, there seems to be a direct relationship between tight time planning and high income. The highest paid professionals in our society, from whom come fully 25% of self-made millionaires in America, are lawyers, doctors and other medical professionals. 
Every one of them manages their time in terms of minutes spent on each case, or with each patient. The people who earn the very least in our society are those who think of their time in terms of the day, the week or the month. They have no problem wasting the first half of the day. They justify this by saying they will catch up in the afternoon. Sometimes they waste the first couple of days of the week. They think that they will catch up later on in the week. Sometimes they waste the first one or two weeks of the month. The fatal flaw in monthly quotas. I have worked with countless sales organizations over the years. Fully 80% of the salespeople in these organizations, all of whom work on monthly quotas, take it easy for the first three weeks of the month and then suddenly go into a state of frantic activity during the last week, working desperately to make enough sales to hit their quotas. But not the top people. The top people work on the first day of the month with the same focus and intensity that they worked on the last day of the previous month. They hit the road running, like the roadrunner, with his legs moving under him. They put the pedal to the metal at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. They beat the rush hour traffic by getting in before anyone else, and they beat the rush hour traffic in the evening by staying and working long after everyone else has rushed out to sit on the freeway. Generate continuous energy. Mentally and physically, the faster you move, the more energy you have. The faster you move, the more positive you feel. The faster you move, the happier you are. The faster you move, the more enthusiastic and creative you become. The faster you move the more you get done, the more you get paid and the more successful you feel. Apply the momentum principle to your life. Once you start going, keep going. Alan Lacane, the time management specialist said, fast tempo is essential to success. Tom Peters said that all successful people have a bias for action. The key to getting more things done is for you to select your most important task and then to start it with a sense of urgency. This is the real key to success and high achievement. Do something every day. 1. Resolve today to pick up the pace in your life. Move faster from task to task. Walk quickly. Develop a higher tempo of activity. 2. Imagine you were going away tomorrow for a month and you had to get caught up on everything before you left. Work as hard and as fast as you do just before you leave for vacation. 3. Practice tight time planning. Imagine that you only had half the time available to get the job done and work with a sense of urgency all day long. 4. Continually ask for more responsibility, and when you get it, complete the task quickly and well. This one habit will continually open doors of opportunity for you. From now on, resolve to get up one hour earlier and get going immediately. Work through lunchtime and coffee breaks. Stay an hour later to get caught up and ready for the next day. These additions will double your productivity and put you onto the fast track in your career. Chapter 21 Persist until you succeed. Few things are impossible to diligence and skill. Great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. Samuel Johnson. Every great success in your life will represent a triumph of persistence. Your ability to decide what you want to begin, and then to persist through all obstacles and difficulties until you achieve your goals is the critical determinant of your success. And the flip side of persistence is courage. Perhaps the greatest challenge that you will ever face in life is the conquest of fear and the development of the habit of courage. Winston Churchill once wrote, courage is rightly considered the foremost of the virtues, for upon it, all others depend. The conquest of fear. Fear is, and always has been, the greatest enemy of mankind. When Franklin D. Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, he was saying that the emotion of fear, rather than the reality of what we fear, is what causes us anxiety, stress, and unhappiness. When you develop the habit of courage and unshakable self-confidence, a whole new world of possibilities opens up for you. Just think, what would you dare to dream, or be, or do, if you weren't afraid of anything in the whole world? You can learn anything you need to learn. Fortunately, the habit of courage can be learned just as any other success skill is learned. To do so, you need to go to work on yourself to conquer your fears, while simultaneously building up the kind of courage and confidence that will enable you to deal with the inevitable ups and downs of life unafraid. Syndicated columnist Ann Landers wrote these words, if I were asked to give what I consider the single most useful bit of advice for all humanity, it would be this, expect trouble is an inevitable part of life, and when it comes, hold your head high. 
Look it squarely in the eye, and say, I will be bigger than you. You cannot defeat me. This is the kind of attitude that leads to victory. The causes and cures of fear. The starting point in overcoming fear and developing courage is, first of all, to look at the factors that predispose us toward being afraid. As we know, the root source of fear is childhood conditioning, usually destructive criticism from one or both parents, that causes us to experience two types of fear. These are, first of all, the fear of failure, which causes us to think, I can't, I can't, I can't, and second, the fear of rejection, which causes us to think, I have to, I have to, I have to. Because of these fears, we become preoccupied with the fears of losing our money, or our time, or our emotional investment in a relationship. We become hypersensitive to the opinions and possible criticisms of others, sometimes to the point where we are afraid to do anything that anyone else might disapprove of. Our fears tend to paralyze us, holding us back from taking constructive action in the direction of our dreams and goals. We hesitate. We become indecisive. We procrastinate. We make excuses and find reasons to delay. And finally, we feel frustrated, caught in the double bind of, I have to, but I can't, or, I can't, but I have to. Fear and ignorance go together. Fear can be caused by ignorance. When we have limited information, we may be tense and insecure about the outcome of our actions. Ignorance causes us to fear change, to fear the unknown and to avoid trying anything new or different. But the reverse is also true. The very act of gathering more information and experience in a particular area gives us more courage and confidence in that area. There are parts of your life where you have no fear at all because you have mastered that area, like driving a car, skiing or selling and managing. Because of your knowledge and experience, you feel completely capable of handling whatever happens. You have no fears. Fatigue doth make cowards of us all. Another factor that causes fear is illness or fatigue. When we are tired or unwell, or when we are not physically fit, we are more predisposed to fear and doubt than when we are feeling healthy and happy and energetic. Sometimes you can totally change your attitude toward yourself and your potential by getting a good night's sleep, or taking a vacation long enough to completely recharge your mental and emotional batteries. Rest and relaxation build courage and confidence as much as any other factors. Everyone is afraid. Here is an important point. All intelligent people are afraid of something. It is normal and natural to be concerned about your physical, emotional and financial survival. The courageous person is not a person who is unafraid. As Mark Twain said, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear not absence of fear. It is not whether or not you are afraid. We are all afraid. The question is, how do you deal with the fear? The courageous person is simply one who goes forward in spite of the fear. And here is something else I have learned. When you confront your fears and move toward what you are afraid of, your fears diminish while at the same time, your self-esteem and self-confidence increases.